It's often said that Final Fantasy IX is the most fairy tale, funny, and lighthearted of the Final Fantasies. And while all of this might be true, it doesn't take away from the fact that it also deals with some of the most serious philosophical issues life throws at us. A great war and a twink on a dragon might be the foreground of what we see, the window dressing, the icing on the cake if you will, but they do in fact serve as mere backgrounds to the real character drama that goes on here. Whether they play out in underground factories, atop airships, or in bunk beds during chats in the night in quiet villages. And despite the terrifying action scenes playing their important part, from kidnapping a princess on an airship, to watching a helpless village getting torn to pieces by the force of a godlike creature, I do maintain that the soul of Final Fantasy IX, frankly any game that dares to tell a story about humans, lies specifically in those quiet moments, whether the beautiful, the funny, or the more existential ones. Despite not being the Final Fantasy I've completed the most times in my life, it is the Final Fantasy I've started the most playthroughs on. Now while these facts might sound if not contradictory, then at least indicative of a game that's hard to stick to, I think of it differently. To me, Final Fantasy IX has become that mystical game that never seems to let go, that's always there in the background, urging me to get back to it even though I don't always have time to see the journey through. You see, Final Fantasy games used to be long and arduous affairs, often demanding somewhere around 40 hours to complete the main story alone, meaning chances were you get quite attached to your newfound friends every time. But while Square Enix seems unable to think of little but Final Fantasy VII these days, why am I still so mystified with Final Fantasy IX? Why does Final Fantasy IX hit different? The Final Fantasy series was always a different beast, each title seemingly experimenting with some new setting and mishmash of vibes. Final Fantasy X, my first entry into the series, takes place in a dystopian sci-fi turned medieval universe. Final Fantasy VII, another dystopian universe by the way, also feels quite sci-fi, but is almost more dark capitalist punk than anything. Indeed, the later years often continued with ambiguous settings, with Final Fantasy XIII also showcasing a magical sci-fi background, and XV, well, ugh, we don't talk about XV. To me then, Final Fantasy IX became the only one of these games that took place in a legitimately classical fairy tale medieval setting, although with some serious sci-fi influences sprinkled across. This duality is what ends up making Final Fantasy IX's plot so fascinating all these years later. But the key is that it's backed up by genius design, not just in terms of everything going on here, but how Square managed to make this PS1 world come alive. And if you want to help this channel truly come alive, then please remember to subscribe to the channel, leave a like on the video, and a comment down below. It really makes a difference. Something I always think about before jumping into yet another Final Fantasy IX playthrough that somehow ends up stranding at the Moogle safe spot in Evil Forest is how expansive, detailed, and beautiful the city of Limblom looks. A city literally carved into a giant mountain, where the main access is by rail cars or airships. We have grand market squares, charming clock towers high above ground, cozy hideouts, a theater district, an industrial district, and a quaint local pub. Cities like Limblum could be imagined to come accompanied with some type of majestic soundtrack because of how grand it is. But instead, its theme is reserved, yet rhythmic, melodic, without straying too far from the game's uncertain yet whimsical nature, and portrays a kind of tension while retaining a sense of childish desire for exploration. Alexandria, the royal capital bathed in sun, looks arguably even more classically fairytale-y. It's impossible to not get charmed by the city's inner towers, its large market square, its smaller outer square, the back alley, or the city's portside district and pier, reminding us that there's more to cities than just brick and mortar. Due to the way the camera angles worked way back when on the PS1, you'll notice how every scene's viewing angle is carefully placed to give you the optimal overview of them, which in turn creates a very unique and distinct sense of place and atmosphere. It looks cinematic in a way that modern games like Final Fantasy XVI, all these years later, can't match in the same way, simply because of the different design philosophies of perspective. I'm not saying Final Fantasy IX's way of doing things is objectively better, but I think you know what I mean here. When thinking of any location in Final Fantasy IX, you'll always remember that exact place, with that exact camera angle. And I think it supercharges our memories of them, because no matter how many times you return, or how long between your homecomings, these images truly never change. It's part of why in those moments before I fire up a new game, that flashes of locations all over the story remind me of how great this game is. Indeed, why it hits different, and that compels me to join Zidane once more. 
and Zidane is of course a big deal in Final Fantasy IX, seeing as he is the main protagonist. But what's so fascinating here is that both he and his companions and beyond are all quite, well, distinct. It's no secret that the characters and their designs are important in every Final Fantasy, heck in every game, but I'd say they're perhaps particularly prominent and stand out all the more right here due to the game's overall vision. Even though we find ourselves in an ironically quite familiar type of world, at least to European audiences perhaps, who grew up with similarly set medieval fairy tales, everything here is wrapped in a sense of otherworldliness, which doesn't just extend to, but quite literally begins with our characters. If you spend just a little too much time in the main menu, the game casually runs this reel of every major character that joins our party. And while this could be seen as a spoiler of some kind, it somehow doesn't hurt the game at all. I'm actually quite finicky about not being spoiled, but Final Fantasy IX somehow did it right, and I think it's because it focused on the right aspects, and they're twofold. Our characters look distinctly fantastical, sometimes positively animalistic or anthropomorphic, styles which stand in stark contrast to the previous Final Fantasies of 7 and 8 where, despite looking like total squares, did at least go for a realistic look. And second, that we here get a snapshot into each and every character's personalities and their main background trait. Zidane's virtue and quote, you don't need a reason to help people, might just be the most traditional one here, the one standing the least out. Because mostly everything else here draws a pattern that's quite unlike any other game in the series. Vivi's sorrow, Aiko's solitude, and Freya's despair. These are mature themes and labels to put smack down next to the main characters that look like anime babies and an oversized rat. Indeed, the character designs are some of the least realistic the series has ever seen. Drawn in part by character designer Toshiyuki Itahana, they were also inspired by the dark fantasy movie The Dark Crystal from 1982, which relatively recently got its own Netflix remake by the way. And once you see the resemblance there, it can't really be unseen. But that doesn't mean the characters feel unrealistic. In fact, they somehow become the opposite. Making excessive but tactical use of gesturing, in addition to purposefully and proportionally large heads and hands, Itahana explains that the character's large limbs make it easy to convey emotions through exaggerated reactions, just like actors do in theater. And when you think about it, it really makes sense. Like Itahana suggests further that a style like this can appeal to both kids and adults, it makes so much sense to create animated and cartoon-like characters for a console whose graphics look like this. The less fidelity you got to work with, the more creative you have to be with your characters to make them come alive. And I think Final Fantasy IX's designers did an amazing job. But what's important to note here is that few games manage so well to not just create characters who deal with serious themes while looking positively goofy, but who are also able to develop these characters and make them undergo deeply personal journeys and who markedly change vital aspects of themselves from start to finish. But rather than the main story and the plot, I think this is mostly owed to the game's writing, credited mainly to Hironobu Sakaguchi, who'd worked on several Final Fantasy games by the time 9 rolled around, but who stated that 9 indeed was his personal favorite. As a matter of fact, Fantasian, the JRPG exclusive to Apple Arcade on iOS devices and both produced and written by Sakaguchi, is so reminiscent of Final Fantasy 9 that I wholeheartedly recommend checking that game out as well if you haven't already, and if you've missed a certain modern refresh of the Final Fantasy 9 formula. At any rate, I've always believed that a story is only as strong as its writing, specifically character dialogue writing, and the cast of Final Fantasy IX is written in a way that makes each and every personality shine through. It's why you can touch the electricity when Zidane is finally properly introduced to Princess Garnet, why you can feel the confusion, curiosity and sadness of Vivi as he gets closer to the answers of his own mortality, and why it is despite being something of a knucklehead that Steiner's devotion to loyalty to his princess and kingdom is charming. It makes it mean even more when you experience these people grow and change, learn new things about themselves and the world around them, and Final Fantasy IX dares to throw a few curveballs at you in a way you'll never expect, much of which you'll feel all the more because of how tightly written and personified these animated pixels really are. This is also why that need to return to Final Fantasy IX is so particularly strong. Alongside our characters and their motivations, that sense of a true journey, both for the characters as a team, as their own people, and for the players themselves, is ever-present and alluring. But the fact that it's all set to that score by composer Nobuo Umatsu is in the end what brings it all together. I always have a tough time comparing and contrasting the soundtrack of games like Final Fantasy 7, 9, and 10, and even though I do hold a button on 10 due to its variety, 9 does again bring a certain fairy tale simplicity to the game, but a simplicity that's immediately comforting, unique, and even daring. 
Because the fact of the matter is that Final Fantasy IX is so many things all at once, even though its themes might be coming in waves depending on the disc you're currently on. The lighthearted tones of the village of Dali when the game is still just beginning, or the equally comforting tunes of the South Gate, or indeed the world map's homey melodies, stands in star contrast to the somber score of the ruins of Bermsia, the sinister tune of a sinister man, or the apocalyptic existential angst of Pandemonium. While Final Fantasy IX doesn't have the universal range of Final Fantasy X, it does have signature tracks that fit so well with every scene and every mood, almost to an overly expressive way that makes you understand and truly feel the emotions and stakes at play here. Indeed, just like with the characters and their designs, the music of Final Fantasy IX appears to me just as theatrical, just as animated, and just as characterized as the characters themselves, in all the right ways. And just as Sakaguchi thinks of Final Fantasy IX as the best title in the series, so does composer Umatsu consider his work on Final Fantasy IX as his best work too. Coincidentally, it happens to be Nobuo's last solo work in a Final Fantasy game, which shouldn't mean anything for the game in reality, but might help to give it a certain uniform sound direction, which allows the game to keep a very distinct style throughout, while at the same time managing to stay varied. But Final Fantasy IX wouldn't be able to hit different if it also didn't offer a combat and leveling system that actually works. Final Fantasy IX utilizes that classic active turn-based combat system that was tradition back in the day, but which Square has clearly firmly left behind, at least for their main number entries. It was always fun to play with because of its tactical intensity, but ironically I think it's aged really well because it remains turn-based. You see, ever since Square ditched its more traditional systems after Final Fantasy X-2, they've had their new highs and lows, but very little has felt as competent as when they did what they done gone do best. It doesn't hurt that Final Fantasy IX can be brutal as well, with regular enemies being tough as nails if you don't mind the flow of battle or take advantage of enemy weaknesses. And every time you hit up a new blacksmith and get yourself a new weapon, I love feeling that difference in damage output, which in my opinion is the mark of a great role-playing game, since I really do think that a sense of progression and experience return on investment is vital. This is closely linked to the equipment system, which is actually where most of the progression is felt. This is because every ability you ever learn in Final Fantasy IX comes directly from your weapons and armor. But the kicker, what makes it truly great, is that to inherently learn these abilities, you have to gain enough ability points from battles, which in turn allow you to retain these abilities when you equip a new piece of gear. This makes equipment doubly fun to collect, since you're not just preoccupied with how much stronger it makes your characters, but also which new abilities they'll suddenly be able to take advantage of. Again, it's all about that sense of progression, making you feel like you're actually making progress as you go, and which does reward you for fighting battles other than simply to level up your characters. On top of this, we have ability points which allow us to equip skills, giving our characters immunities, improved attacks against certain enemies, or other enhancements that really make a difference. In terms of progression systems then, I feel like Final Fantasy IX gets way less cred than it should, but it is a central pillar of why the game feels so much fun to actually play, and not just follow along with all these years later. Final Fantasy IX is a game that wears its heart on its sleeve in quite literally everything it does. It doesn't shy away from being funny, goofy, sad, deep, genuine or simply human, and that is actually rather poetic, seeing as the question of humanity and what the human experience is, is so integral to the game. There are so many ways to play Final Fantasy IX these days, from on mobile to the PC and console remasters, but if I were to give a recommendation, I think the best way to play Final Fantasy IX right now is by way of the Moguri mod on PC, or indeed on the Steam Deck, where modders have managed to make a remaster that actually feels like like a remaster, better high resolution and repainted background, several options related to how the game works, and even a full 16x9 image scaling rather than the ugly square empty space format is phenomenal and makes such a massive difference at the end of the day. Alternatively, you could play it on a 4x3 retro console, which actually is surprisingly fun. But no matter where or how you play Final Fantasy IX, the story, the characters, the music and the gameplay return, and it remains that same good old game it was back in 2000. Final Fantasy IX is definitely one of my favorite games of all time, and I will continue to return to it for years to come. But what do you think? Let me know your thoughts on Final Fantasy IX in the comments, and remember to leave a like and subscribe to the channel. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Cheers!